Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Secret Pioneer webinar. I mean, the topic again is the HIP and the, the HIP chair of Secret. Uh, I will chair, co chair this uh, webinar with my colleague, Luis. Luis, welcome. And um, I would like to invite you to participate and collaborate with us in this fantastic webinar that is the, I think it's the 12th webinar in Secret Pioneer and the fifth uh, focusing hip problems. Remember that we are going to go around the hip 360 degrees, just uh, talking about topics like preserving surgery, revision, primary. And then at this time, our uh, topic is the complex or the challenging primary total hip arthroplasty. Uh, and we will focus in, in practical issues, in practical aspect, uh, um, like uh, how to do it. So uh, let's go uh, to present our, our webinar. And uh, I will give uh, the, the, the chance to my co-chair, Luis, to present the speakers and the topic for this webinar. Thank you so much for being there. So thank you, Oliver. So thanks all of you for joining this webinar. So first I would like to introduce our faculty. It's a great honor to have a free world renowned hip surgeons joining our webinars as a panelist who will give you valuable comments uh, during the discussions. First, we have Professor John Neck from United States, President of the Hip Society. And we will also, we also have Professor Suedis from Greece, President of the European Hip Society. And we also have Professor Law from Pakistan, President of the Asia Pacific Hip Societies. Welcome all of our panelists. And we also have a free CCOT Hip Committee members who will present a challenging clinical case. So first we have Hua Sen from Malaysia, and we have Nicholas from Colombia, and Louis Shen, that's me, from Hong Kong. So in fact, we are also the current or the past presidents of the National Afro Party Af Associations. Therefore, including Oliver, uh, presidents of the Sea Hip uh, Committee, we actually have seven presidents joining today's webinar uh, as faculty. So I'm sure today's event will be an exciting event. So without further ado, I would like to invite Hua Sen to present the first case to Erode. So Hua Sen, please. Hi. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to, to everyone. So, so first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Oliver and Luis for this opportunity to present my case on uh, two eroded. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm Hua Sen Chua. I'm from Sunway Medical Center, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. This case, I'll start off with the history. So it's a 62 year old gentleman who has a previous history of a right hip septic arthritis about a year ago. So he was treated with arthrotomy washout as well as three months of antibiotics by uh, another hospital. And he was then pronounced infection free. And he presented to me with a progressively painful right hip associated with the significant stiffness as well as right lower limb shortening. And on physical examination, this 62-year-old gentleman is well-nourished. He came in into my office ambulating with a walker with a short limb as well as an nostalgic gait. Uh, on examination of the right hip, the, there were global reduction in range of motion of the right hip, with flexion only 30 degree, abduction of 15 degree, a deduction of zero, external rotation of five, and internal rotation of zero as well. And there is a limb length discrepancy with the right lower limb shortening of about 2 cm. This is the x-rays that I had uh, upon sending him for my uh, from for, for x-rays. Um, that's the right hip that is in question. Um, so... 
the first thing that came to my mind is to rule out infection because we we are we never so sure that the infection is completely ruled out so what i did was i sent some blood off and the blood parameters were all normal i also get my uh, intervention radiologist friend to get a ct guided aspiration as well as culture uh, all the cultures were negative six cultures were sent i sent him for a bone scan which also sh showed to be negative on infection so at the current moment we are talking about a total hip arthroplasty because he is in pain and he cannot ambulate properly so the, the question now is the main problem obviously is an estabular defect and i look into the estabular defect and after a ct scan was done i classify it to be a paproski type 2a which is fairly contained with all the wall of anterior posterior and superior still fairly intact uh there is a a superior medial uh bone defect within the estabulum so now we go to our first poll on options and of the estabular reconstruction Professor Sahid Nor, can you comment what these options? What would you choose in that case? Uh, fine. So very well described patient, uh, an infection in blood parameters and aspiration has been uh, ruled out. But I will counsel the patient that there are still higher chances of infection compared to a version. Uh, I'll have both the option of cemented and uncemented uh, hip replacement availability on my OR um, and my preference will be uncemented. The femur is Christine. I would like to have the target of bringing the hip center back to uh, native uh, to the contralateral normal anatomy. I would have a stable fixation with uncemented porous coated and fixation with a couple of screws. Uh, I would also use bone grafting, um, either autogenous and the proximal femur, to fill in the medial bone defect. Uh, Professor Noah, do you think it will be enough uh, bone to, to put the graft in just with the femoral head, or do you use from the bone bank any type of, uh, of bone or any we, bone substitute? We, we, we have uh, our own bone bank. And also we have BMP and we have, uh, we I, so we can have uh, allograph, uh, autograph, as well as uh, substitute. So we'll have combination. Great. Yes, I would like to know the, the opinion about that from Eleftherios, from the European Society. In Europe, do you think will be the same, this kind of graft? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I think it's an opportunity. Uh, you've got the chance to use the native uh, uh, femoral head however maybe very sclerotic after so many years of, uh, low viability uh, i would be a little bit concerned about uh, the collars line has been reached i don't know what's happening in the bottom end of the socket the inner plate of the socket uh, it looks like there is a little bit of a, like a, a type one or type two protrusion type now um uh i would go for fresh frozen allograft impaction grafting. We do that routinely with uh, cemented sockets, but can be done equally successful and uh, uh, with uh, uh, acetabular uh, uncemented socket as well with screws up and down. It's a huge defect. A small one goes down to this line uh, and goes quite so. It's not going to be easily manageable with a small size socket, but it's still contained. Thank you, Lesterio. So we have the opinion from Asia, from Europe, and now go to the other part of the globe. Uh, Bill, uh, Professor Dironek, what would you do in US? I mean, do you use this graft from the bone bank or do you use another uh, option? I think um, we usually try and figure out the solution that would be the easiest and, and have the best chance of survival. And um, I actually think that a jumbo cementless cup would not be a bad idea, and I would be prepared for that with 
bone grafting behind it. I'd probably use autologous graft since you have the thermal head right there. Um, some people might use an orange slice uh, metallic graft superiorly to try and uh, hold the, uh, the cup uh, more inferiorly, closer down to the teardrop. I think you I think the key part with this case is having what you think will work, but also having a backup plan. So my backup plan would certainly be a cage. Um, so I'd want to have that somewhere available in case I got into real trouble. Um, I don't think I would use a bulk allograft. Um, I think that's pretty much not uh, not used across the world. Uh, as much as it was, and uh, impaction grafting, I think, is an is certainly an option. This is a contained defect, and it, and it could certainly work. It adds time and probably some expense to the uh, to the procedure. And I think in these cases, we want to come up with the the most rapid, simple solution we can, and that's why I would uh, I would go with C to start, but with backups if I got into trouble. It's, it's amazing. As you can see, Luis, I mean, we have opinion from different parts of the world with different, you know, point of view. And this is amazing. Why? You have different options for your case. Uh, so uh, let's see what say the audience. And the audience uh, result of the poll is, okay, they say 43% will use impaction bone grafting. 29% will use bulk allograft, who was not very popular in between our speakers and, and faculty. And 14% um, will use metal augments. So what, what, what did you do? So I chose um, impaction bone grafting. So um, I, so, so the first challenge intraoperatively actually is the difficulty in dislocating the joint. Because obviously down the, the whole thing is protrusional inside. And uh, I am very, very mindful that uh, I do not want to injure any part of the wall at all to create an uncontained defect from a contained one. So what I did was I did an inside to cutting of the femoral neck and uh, then only have the revised femoral neck cut to the level where I want. Yeah. And... Um, um, why is it impaction bone grafting? Uh, impaction bone grafting, obviously, for all those of you who are not familiar with, is actually the vigorous impaction of bone chips into the bone defect. Nowadays, we believe that the the size of the bone chip is important as well. It should be roughly in the size of about um, 9 to 15 mm in diameter. That will give a good... Uh, mechanical uh, strength. And uh, I use cemented components for impaction bone grafting uh, simply because I think with cemented component for impaction bone grafting, then you can have an evenly channel load uh, to the impacted bone graft. And uh, that will increase the chances of a bone incorporation. So the rationale behind of my choice is when where the bone is missing, try to replace it with bone. Uh, we, we, we will restore the suitable environment for the cement fixation. We will restore the bone stock. Obviously, I want to bring the heat back to the biomechanical anatomy and then function through the pain relief. So these are my infection instruments. Um, I got the obviously I got the allograft from a fresh frozen allograft femoral head extra bone uh, rather than just the patient's bone um, in, intraoperatively the, in, the the head of the, the femur is fairly sclerotic and uh, I also wasn't very very sure about the potential uh, nidus of infection just in case that's happening inside the head still so I did not use the head I used an allograft um and uh and did an IBG. So that's the femoral allograft that I use. Uh, I pack it 
to the right hand side of the thing if you can see that's a good bed of a uh, bone graft that is there um then i cement in a cup as well as i do cemented stem so i'm pretty much a totally cemented stem guy i do 100 percent of my hit uh exeter hit so this is the immediate post-op x-rays that i have um and um that six week post op with uh, osteo integration and integration shown I, I would love to to hear from the expert about the the outcome of the the, the result oliver uh, professor nor any comment on that i think uh what we have heard what is the beauty of this webinar is that we have a north american view we have a european view and we have an Asia Pacific view. And to the audience, there are more than one way of dealing with the problem and could have a successful result. So this very nicely done impaction bone grafting. So impaction bone grafting is actually a dying skill. And this needs to be restored, especially in developing country. But then we have a very simple solution as mentioned by Bill, that he would use an uncemented cup an uncemented uh, femur um, and have a very good outcome. So very nicely done. Uh, I would do it slightly differently. Uh, Preoperatively, we had seen Proteusio, uh, but here we have seen a very good Im uh, impaction of bone grafting and lateralization of the, of the cup. Um, I would have personally uh, would like to have it slightly more medialized, but very nicely done. Excellent. So uh, it was it was very nice your your sentence. Uh, uh, wow. You said it, there is loss of bone. You put more bone in, but probably in US, as uh, Bill has mentioned, this is not so true. So uh, Bill, uh, in in US, it's more more popular to to when you have a some bone defect filling with uh, metal is that correct? no i don't think that's completely right i mean i think people still do a fair amount of impaction grafting for certain situations uh, the, the really patchless uh femur I, I think people will still do that and some and sometimes obviously the impaction grafting results are actually better on the socket side than they are the femoral side so i i would not critique this um surgery at all i think it was a it was a good job and i agree with dr Noor. there are lots of different ways to accomplish it in the u.s um we are being more and more uh, limited economically um everybody thinks that we have an unlimited amount of money but it looks like that's drying up in a hurry and i think people are trying to come up with solutions that are going to be long lasting but also uh, fairly rapid, and I think a cementless uh, wow. socket and stem would would uh, probably work. You might have to graft on the acetabulum, you might have to use a, a metallic graft, but I think you could get that to work with fairly with good durability uh, in uh, much less time in the hour hour and fifteen minute time. So. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bill and and Elefterius, just. One quick comment about there are some options between these two. I mean, between impaction grafting and some metal. And uh, there is yeah. an option to use any kind of metal augments and bone grafting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, someone could possibly uh, think of uh, putting a, a roof augment uh, from trabecular metal so to, to decrease the uh, north to south uh, diameter. Sometimes this defect is oval shape. So you really need to bring it down to a, a round shape. Uh, to fit underneath uh, a um, an uncemented socket. Um, I believe impaction grafting is a wonderful technique. Here in Europe, you, we use it a lot. And I want to congratulate uh, the author, uh, Wa, for uh, your excellent job. Uh, just uh, probably something we do, I was trained in Exeter. We drill through the, through the graft uh, peg holes for the cement to go up and down. Probably you've done it uh, and uh, is not obvious in the um, X-ray, but it is something sometimes we also advise. So regardless, the grafting is so tightly uh, packed that you can drill holes. We have peg holes with the cement there as well. 
Uh, other than that, is a wonderful technique, extra hip, uh, up and down, survival sip uh, of the extra, standard extra technique uh, without impaction grafting is over 35 years now. And for the impaction grafting, for the young people, like the particular, not young, I mean, fairly young people, like this one is over 15 years with impaction grafting. So I think the results are promising. It's a biological reconstruction and uh, the um, augments uh, are there, very viable. The not very long follow-up as yet. Yeah, thank you so much. Unfortunately, time is uh, running out. So uh, Luis, can you present the next case and the next uh, speakers? Thank you both for, for your comments. Thank you. So maybe Nicholas present the second case first. Nicholas, uh, are you ready? Can you, you check? Me? Yeah, Nicholas, can you put in the presentation mode? Yeah. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Hear me? Yeah, great. That's well, <laughs> uh, we have to deal with a difficult problem sometimes. Sometimes we have to deal with post traumatic cases, too immobile. Severe protrusion, as we saw in the last presentation, ankylosis, spondylitis, and, and probably uh, in our country we have problems like this, patients with arthrodiasis, with or without material. But all have in common that this is too immobile, the exposure, bad abductors, bad bone, and position. The first question for the audience in these cases, what do you do? You perform it? or send it to your enemy. <laughs> oh, I never had it, the opportunity, but I will do it. Oh, I don't think it's worth and prefer to leave this patient like that. So, Nico, can you go back to previous X-ray, the last X-ray? Uh, uh, that's it's only for introduction, but the case, the oh, first okay, case the is case, this one. Oh, the first case is, is this case is uh, for two years old with an infant's problem. We don't know what happened, but right now it's inflection and adoption deformity with limb. It's probably fixed, but we don't use, he don't, doesn't use a cane, but have a lumbar, gluten, and the knee of the other side pain. It's 42 years, we roll out infections. Uh, this is the, the, the patient in the OR, rigid completely, completely rigid, rigid. He can move nothing. What do you do? Uh, I don't know, Electorius. So why not can what I invite uh, Professor Reedis uh, to share some of your thoughts and then technical difficulties in this case? Yeah, uh, the question for the audience between uh, you asked once Elefterus talk us is what are the technical challenges in this arthrodes uh, patient to find the acetabulum, uh, to rim at the real orientation, how to descend it, reduce instability on all of them. So that's great. All right. So uh, yeah, well, uh, First of all, I'm not 100% sure that this is a, 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 a complete arthrodesis. So it may be or may not be, or it is so advanced arthritis that the, the one bone has stuck to the other. So no joint space, no movement at all. The x-ray looks a little bit obscure unless it's an inlet view. Uh, I don't see the other side, but it looks like um, that uh, the uh, iliac wing is actually facing us like an inlet view. I don't know what's happening on the other side. If it is this uh, way, probably this is a post-traumatic something, and I can see the ischial protruding quite well, which means there is possibly a kind of a, a, a threatening protrusion there. Um, now, I cannot comment on anterior and posterior walls, so I would go for a CT scan and 3D, 3D reconstruction, of course, uh, to know my anatomy and where I stand. I would go for a posterior approach for sure, uh, for this kind of uh, difficult hips, no anterior approach for those cases. And um, of course, I may use uh, the uh, CR during surgery. 
Uh, I not try to do a dislocation if it is very difficult to avoid because I can see some osteoporosis there, maybe. Uh, I would cut uh, the bone uh, in situ, the neck in situ, and then try to follow the uh, north, south, front and back through the posterior approach is easy, relatively easy, and then dig down uh, the, um, uh, the femoral head. And then probably uh, I will uh, go for an uncemented prosthesis unless the femoral component, the femur is very osteoporotic from disuse uh, uh, for many years, in which case I would go for a hybrid. Now, if this is a deformity, long-standing deformity with a fixed flexion deformity, you may need to release the anterior capsule quite a lot. Maybe the source as well, which is a kind of a disabling um, uh, process. Uh, but uh, in this case, I may, I may consider dual mobility as well. A hybrid dual mobility would be my final option. Ooh, thank okay. you for coming. I think uh, dual mobility is a good choice because the, most of the time, the muscles, especially the abductors, is atrophic. So I think this is, uh, uh, I think, I have extra precautions uh, to prevent this location in some cases. So maybe. I think I agree that uh, all individual patients need to be individualized and preoperative assessment and planning is mandatory, including good quality X-ray, CT scan, and have an uh, approach. Um, I would approach it in a different way. I'm a Harding's approach person, and I have converted uh, arthrodesis into total hip replacement through a Harding's approach. And uh, I agree that these patients are difficult with soft tissue contracture and release, and they have increased chances of dislocation. So a dual mobility, a good uncemented fixation, a dual mobility to prevent dislocation would be my priority. Um, obviously, on the femur side, I would use uncemented, and I would maybe use a strom uh, femoral component to correct my orientation of the neck. It will give me advantage during the OR table to get it right absolutely. So thank you. So Bill, are then you are mute. We can hear you now, Bill. Bill, can you unmute the press the unmute button? Sorry about that. These cases of takedown fusion are not as good as regular total hips. And so I, I think it's important uh, that we have that discussion with the patient. The second uh, thing is nerve palsies are not uncommon with takedown fusions. And I think it is helpful to, as if you're coming on the posterior approach, and I would agree a, a posterior approach that could be extensile is pro probably the best uh, move or a direct lateral, but not uh, but in this situation. The last thing I would say is sometimes those abductors are so matted and contracted that exposure is a real um, problem. And Sometimes there's a role for a trochanteric osteotomy. I use something called a trochanteric slide where you keep the, the vastus lateralis attached to that trochanteric fragment. It's a more vertical fragment. It doesn't have to be particularly thick, but that helps not only in holding it in once you have to wire it, if it looks like you, you, have, you have to, but it can also... Um, help your exposure dramatically. So if you're, you're flailing, I think that is an option. Um, and sometimes it makes it actually easier to do the osteotomy in situ. I think okay. that's, that's about it.